Good evening. I want to begin our evening. Uh, we may have a few more people who come wandering in, but uh, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I promise you, you're in for a treat. My name is Jim Stockard. I'm the curator of the Loeb Fellowship here at the Graduate School of Design. And so it gives me particular pleasure to introduce our guest tonight because she is an alumna of the Loeb Fellowship, truly one of the GSD's own. So I'm guessing that from time to time, many of us have thought about how great it would be to have a job in philanthropy, right? Somebody else puts up a big pile of money for some noble purpose. You get to write large checks to organizations that are working on solving problems in that field. You sit behind a big desk all day and you let people, good people tell you the good things they're doing. You decide who gets a check. Pretty cool gig, huh? Only my impression is it's not quite that simple. For one thing, every check you write is a gamble. You don't know if it's going to work or not. You're hoping or you're guessing or you're praying that the efforts of this group will succeed in the fight to improve conditions that you care about. You can never be sure the project you're funding will succeed and you can never be sure that people will even stay around to make sure that it does succeed. And since you really care about the issues, you're actually doing more than writing a check. You're putting some of your heart into that decision you make. Your hopes and your beliefs have to be executed by others not by you, you're not on the front line. There's certainly great successes in philanthropy, but there are also some frustrations. Unless you're a robot, it's a demanding and sometimes frustrating and even painful work. And once in a while, it will break your heart. The wisest of people who work in this arena, and that list certainly includes our guest tonight, have learned that this is actually not a passive vocation. The last thing they do is sit behind a desk and listen to proposals all day. In fact, they think creatively about ways to attack stubborn problems. They find partners with whom they can create innovative programs. They leave the office to engage with the communities they hope to help. They realize they have one asset to contribute, money, but they also value the wisdom and insights of communities they serve and of their partners. Over the years, they incorporate the wisdom of their partners into their own design of funding initiatives. India Pierce Lee is the perfect example of one of these exceptional philanthropists. She has built her expertise by serving at every level of community development work. She headed a CDC in her hometown, learning what makes sense and what doesn't by walking the streets of the Mount Pleasant neighborhood. That caught the attention of the city, so they asked her to run their empowerment zone which expanded her experience into retail and commercial and the employment worlds. She then became the senior program director for a national intermediary, LISC, serving all the CDCs in Northeast Ohio. And after a stand at Neighborhood Progress, arguably the best local intermediary in the country, she went to work for the Cleveland Foundation, the oldest community foundation in the country, and among its largest and certainly among its most innovative. Oh, and did I mention that before she found her true calling? She was an air traffic controller? There's a straight line in there somewhere, and I invite you to figure out what it is. You can tell me afterwards. India's title at the Cleveland Foundation is Program Director for Neighborhoods, Housing, and Community Development. And that only begins to cover the breadth of her areas in which she's involved. Her work has included important initiatives in transportation, housing, education, safety, community wealth building, economic inclusion, just to name a few. She's wrapped her caring and creative arms around a critical part of Cleveland, the University Circle neighborhood, which includes both some of the city's and the nation's great institutions and some of the city's poorest people. India has both a big brain and a huge heart. She does this work because she cares about her community. I sometimes suggest to young planners that they start their careers in the rooms they feel most comfortable in. Some will feel most comfortable in boardrooms and skyscrapers, speaking to power. They like wearing suits, and they believe they can influence in a, early in their careers the people who will make big decisions in government and corporate world. Others feel much more at ease in a church basement with their sleeves rolled up, trying to directly help people who are in need of that kind of help. And I suggest to planners that as they start their career in those rooms they feel most comfortable in, they try to expand the rooms in which they feel comfortable because they will always provide better service to the people in any of those rooms to the extent that they know and understand the other rooms. Please join me in greeting a woman who is both welcome and at home in any room in Cleveland. India?
Thank you, Jim. Good evening. Whew. Piper Auditorium. <laughs> First, let me thank Jim and Sally for all the encouragement and all of those that have helped me uh, since I've been a lobe. You know, once you're a lobe, you're always a lobe. And I thank those for inviting me here today because it's an opportunity and I'm very humbled. It's an honor and a blessing to come and talk about the work here. I'd also like to thank Tessa, the Harvard Planning Student Organization, the Lowell Fellowship, and the Dean's Diversity Committee for the pre-reception and getting to talk with you all to this afternoon. And finally, Chantel Blakely, Matthew Smith, and Beth Milstein for all of your assistance helping me to get here. As a Loeb, it is always a pleasure to come back to the GSD. The Loeb Fellowship was an experience that will last for a lifetime and has had a wonderful impact on me personally. This evening's presentation, as Jim has so eloquently talked about, is one of the Cleveland Foundation's most important initiatives, the Greater University Circle Initiative. It is going into its ninth year, and actually when I got selected as a LOBE, this was, the project was just beginning. This is what I brought to the uh, GSD and talked about trying to make these initiatives happen. And we've learned a lot over the last nine years and continue to learn. But at the same time, the collaboration of partners have seen a lot of great things happen. It, I'd also be remiss if I didn't talk about my colleague, Lillian Curry, Program Director for Architecture, Urban Design, and Sustainable Development at the Cleveland Foundation, who is also a GSD grad. So not only do I have the pleasure of being from here, I have a colleague I work with day in and day out that graduated from here as well. Our Greater University Circle Initiative is an ambitious strategy to stimulate reinvestment in core urban neighborhoods in Cleveland. Our goals have been pretty clear from the beginning. Stabilize the neighborhoods around University Circle, create jobs, and build wealth for residents. And let me preface this with the fact that this work is not easy, it's not the silver bullet, but it's a paradigm shift in how we look at community and economic development. It offers practical tools and recommendations for any city or organization that would like to adopt a collaborative asset-based redevelopment agenda. It describes the special challenges and the opportunities of developing a revitalization strategy centered around multiple anchor institutions rather than a single institution. It explains the rationale behind individual programs and where available reports and results to date. And our work profiles real people who have been affected by the Greater University Circle's work. Greater University Circle focuses on institutional partnership, physical development, economic inclusion, and community engagement. But the most important piece is connecting to strategies to buy, live, and hire local. Now, a little bit about the Cleveland Foundation. As Jim mentioned, we are the, the nation's first and oldest community foundation. We're celebrating our centennial year. We have a le legacy of leadership that began with gift from donors. There are over 700 plus community foundations around the US and over 1,100 internationally. Our mission? to enhance the quality of life for all citizens of Greater Cleveland, now and for generations to come, and through our donors, by building community endowment, addressing needs through grant making, and providing leadership on key community issues. The Cleveland Foundation today has about two point $1 billion in our endowment, and we grant about 80 to $90 million annually in Greater Cleveland. And we've given away $1.7 billion since our inception. But we also see ourselves, as Jill mentioned, more than just a grant maker. We're a think tank, a facilitator, trusted advisor, strategic investor, 
a catalyst and a convener, working with so many partners across the city. Our grant dollars are distributed, and this is really important, I think is unique with the foundation. About 50% of our grant making is unrestricted. The other 50% is donor directed. So the piece I'm gonna talk about today where it says proactive is the lead ro role, leadership role we play in greater Cleveland's key vital areas. Those are public education, economic development, neighborhoods housing, human services and youth development, arts and culture. Our Greater University Circle initiative, again, is creating jobs, building wealth, and really looking at how to encourage reinvestment in these seven low-income neighborhoods. Our timeline, in 2003, Ron Richard became the CEO of our foundation. And he came out of business development, not philanthropy, and saw the need to have a proactive, strong com commitment to the committed community and by building networks. In 2005, the Greater University Circle Leadership Group was initiated. And this started with Ron bringing together the CEOs of these anchor institutions. We focused on priority physical development, which we'll talk about a little bit, transportation projects, housing and economic inclusion. Every three years, we update those priorities. We look at what we've accomplished and established three-year goals going forward. And what you'll hear today, I have a video that will talk about this, and you'll get to hear from some of our leaders. At this time, I'll, the video, we'll uh, play the video, and then I'll come back to you and continue this discussion. When the Cleveland Foundation uh, began looking at opportunities to really tap into the economic drivers in the city of Cleveland, it was very clear that the University Circle was one of those areas. It's the Cultural Center of Cleveland home to the Cleveland Orchestra and many of the city's museums. The University Circle area also boasts three powerhouses in education and healthcare, Case Western Reserve University, University Hospitals, and Cleveland Clinic. Back in 2005, the concept was simple. How do we corral the power of these institutions to help transform the impoverished neighborhoods surrounding them? The Greater University Circle Neighborhood. We began looking at the neighborhoods around the campuses of these institutions and saw a unique partnership that can leverage the procurement power and economic engines of these institutions. That procurement power, an amazing $3 billion a year. The problem, much of that was leaving the area. Neighborhoods where the average resident earns less than $19,000 a year. Over the next three years, we're looking at how can we buy local, hire local and live local through different strategies working with these anchors. Well, University Circle is, is really about collaboration and partnership. With collaboration comes leverage and the opportunity to leverage the assets that we already have in the circle and around the circle will make this region even more vibrant than it is today. We understand our workforce comes to the communities and we want to see uh, the communities that surround us succeed and be great places to live and work. We really believe that investments here pay off over the long term for building this community and this organization. We have to be engaged with the community in making things happen. The key for the anchor institutions is we're not going anywhere. We're going to be here no matter what. So it's incumbent upon us to sort of step up the plate and do our fair share to serve as a catalyst. Checking off two important boxes hire local and buy local. The Evergreen Cooperatives are worker-owned cooperative businesses housed right in the Greater University Circle neighborhood. Evergreen is about jobs. It's about wealth building. It's giving people an opportunity. Evergreen is committed to something bigger than all those things, and that's really the transformation of a community. Evergreen includes an industrial use green laundry that services an increasing number of institutions in the area and a solar energy business that is transforming the way local companies are being powered. 
I am a owner versus just a worker. I help make decisions in the company. You nurture it. You, you are instrumental in what it becomes. And that's the difference between working at Evergreen and somewhere else. The most recent addition, Green City Growers, the nation's largest urban hydroponic greenhouse, is producing produce for area institutions and restaurants. All of these companies are green companies, whether they're urban agriculture or whether they're using all green laundry detergents and methods, water saving methods, the solar initiative. Each and every one of these are methods to help us reach this green city goal. That third box, Live Local, is being met by an innovative program called Greater Circle Living. It incentivizes employees from university circle institutions to live where they work. So folks who live in the community uh, or work for a nonprofit can benefit from that and that attracts people to live within the neighborhoods. One of the areas attracting a lot of new residents, Uptown. Which is spectacular because it's residential and retail and restaurants is the missing piece at University Circle. For a contemporary art museum to connect itself to that district makes a lot of sense. It'll become a district of culture and commerce, which I think is a perfect marriage of what a neighborhood, what a revitalized urban environment can be. Connecting visitors to the University Circle neighborhood will be much easier thanks to three transportation projects, a redesign of a complex main thoroughfare and two new RTA rail stations that will serve as gateways to the neighborhood. These rail stations in that quarter are, are more important than ever. It's really a major employment hub. It's a very significant destination for tourists and visitors. We transport. We're not the, the, the attraction. We try to get people to the attraction and, and to jobs. Connecting neighbors to each other and to the area's institutions is another key component of the Greater University Circle Initiative. We have these great partnerships with large institutions to connect them to the people that live in this neighborhood to find ways that they both benefit from the relationship. Folks that live here and people that work here, everyone getting along, deciding what's best for them. Just by sharing the news of what's going on between neighbors, between folks who live on the same street, the neighboring neighborhoods are kind of breaking down the barriers. I think the magic of the Greater University Circle Initiative is the broad thinking of the institutions, the neighborhoods, and philanthropy to come together in a way to see the benefits of how it's a win-win for the anchors working together to really leverage our resources in a way that will make a difference for our community. The term Greater University Circle has now become embedded in uh, Cleveland's future. If we're going to be successful as a city, we have to do things that will move us into the future. Cleveland is moving where the world is going. So again, uh, just to give you an idea, the neighborhoods that we're talking about, this university circle is a one mile area with about 40 cultural institutions, Cleveland Museum of Art, the Severance Hall, Case Western Reserve, many of the institutions here, Cleveland Institute of Music. And around these neighborhoods, these are the neighborhoods we're working in. And in 2005, when we started, it's really important to point out that to bring together the anchors, the Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, the VA, along with the Community Development Co Corporations and take all their master plans and create a consolidated plan was really, you know, unheard of. Uh, getting all those institutions along with the community to share the plans. So we started out, and as you see here in this one mile area in University Circle, we looked at vacant land, very little vacant land, and these big swatches, this is Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals, and Case Western. Then we took a look at poor and unsound building conditions, layer that with indicators of risk, water shutoffs, tax delinquencies, foreclosures, and you put it all together. As you can see, in University Circle, very little disinvestment. But here, right across the street from Cleveland Clinic in the Huff neighborhood, all this disinvestment for over 50 years, these neighborhoods have continued. And there was a recent health study um, just commissioned where the average person living in Huff 
lives to be an average of 64 years and just eight miles east of here in Lyndhurst, a wealthy suburb, the average lifespan is 88.8, .8, almost a 25 years difference in life expectancy because of where a person lives. And this really was the aha moment, I think, for not only the institutions, but everybody. You have about 50 to 60,000 people driving in and out of these neighborhoods every single day to these institutions, about 4,500 uh, residents that work at the institutions living here. And it didn't take long to figure out that it was a win-win for everybody to come together. If you look at, again, the neighborhoods by, just by neighborhoods, this is the household incomes in those neighborhoods as compared to the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. We have approximately 50,000 residents in this five square mile area. Again, income under 18,500. Unemployment, 24%. And that's people 18 to 64 looking for work. If you add people that have just given up, you're talking over 40%. Low education levels, high foreclosure rates. And let me mention those maps that I showed you, that was in 2007, before the crash. So imagine afterwards what we are dealing with now. So as this leadership group continued to meet, we agreed um, quickly to work on projects that were not the responsibility of any single institution but something we could all collaborate on. And I'll, you heard some of it in the video, so I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly uh, just to give an update. We started with um, Uptown Phase One. This is along Euclid Avenue by Case Western Reserve, and anybody that's been to Cleveland or looked at Case Western knew there was no student life anywhere around that campus. And so it was really um, important that we start looking at how do we build this area up so that we can attract not only world class, having students come here, but having you know places for uh, professors and doctors and residents that they could enjoy. And for the Cleveland Foundation, this was our single biggest investment in loans and grants in this one um, in this three block area. We've invested about twelve million dollars in this corridor between. Uptown, Cleveland Institute of Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and other organizations along this area. And this is just an aerial view, a view here from one of the units uh, now that phase one is completed. And you can see MOCA here, the new Museum of Contemporary Art, which is uh, Farshid Masavi um, from um, FNA, FA Architect. And, um, you know, really changing how Euclid Avenue looked. This is Uptown Phase 2, currently under construction. Phase 1, after the first month, they had 70% of the units leased after opening. So quickly was able to get financing for uh, Phase 2 here. And this is, again, under construction now. And what's interesting, working with Case Western um, MRN Limited, the, uh, the uh, developer, you know, we began talking about amenities for the neighborhood, and initially there was supposed to be a Walgreens here. We got them to change it. It's going to be a bowling alley so that people in the community will have somewhere to come. Big step for a developer to give up guaranteed rent, uh, high-paying rent, um, to bring an amenity to the neighborhood. Again, this is uh, MOCA. This is the Cedar Hill, one of the transit um, projects we just talked about. This is coming from a suburb, Cleveland Heights, into Cleveland. And there's a high school, a high performing high school, the uh, Cleveland uh, School, that houses Cleveland School of the Arts, the School of Early College, School of Architecture and Design, and School of Science and Medicine. It's four of the highest performing schools, city schools in the state of Ohio. And about 10,000 people were driving past here every single day and had no clue. And so we raised some money to put fencing and a walking track for the community. But these kids had to get through this mass of concrete and asphalt to get to the school. So with the redevelopment, everything will be over to one side. The kid, 80% of the kids take this public transportation to get there. And now they only have to cross one street to get to their school. Uh, this station here, the new Mayfield Road Station, which will be called Little Italy University Circle, this was a, a station that really was in a bunker, hidden away, um, really uh, 
getting moved to Mayfield will bring together two neighborhoods, Little Italy and University Circle. So if you come into Cleveland, once this is completed, you can come from our airport, get off here on the red line and land right across the street from Severance Hall or University Hospitals. And then lovingly known Suicide Circle, this circle here, uh, by the VA hospital and our institutions. Here you had the Cleveland Museum of Art, Cleveland um, Museum of Natural History, the VA. As you can see, there are no sidewalks, no way for pedestrians to get across. So this will be eliminated, and this is all under construction right now, and create about three to four more acres of parkland in this area. There's a pedestrian pathway that will reconnect the Huff neighborhood across and up into um, Wade Oval, where the museums are, to make it um, really you know, pedestrian friendly for not only the people working there, but for the neighbors that for years and years thought this was not um, for them, that they were cut off from. And then we started with an employer-assisted housing program. Again, we launched this in May of 2008, raised $4 million, $2.5 million from the institutions and $1.5 million from philanthropy. We created a really unique program uh, targeted at home buyers, also a rental component, and for existing residents living there in exterior home repair. And when the program first started, we had very little usage because, you know, the market had turned down. We actually got the institutions to go back and um, really redo the program, so we raised it from 10 to 20,000. The foundation forgivable grant is for any um, full-time full employee working at any nonprofit in our footprint, they can get $10,000 if they buy in this area. And if you work at an institution and your income's under 150, you get to 20 plus to 10. So you can get 30,000 to purchase a house in this area. And it's uh, really taken off since it's been restructured. 80% of the residents moving in now are coming from outside the greater university circle neighborhoods, most of them from out of town. The main thing is the diversity because this, these neighborhoods are primarily 98% African American. And so it's starting to diversify the neighborhoods, which was the intent, and bring people in that typically wouldn't live in these communities. And over the last, these numbers are a little bit higher now, but um, about 1.8 million has been used to date and it has leveraged well over eight and a half million dollars um, in loans and rehab to those homes being purchased. Some of the outcomes, again, um, the transportation projects. We raised a million dollars from the institutions early on for early design funding, which allowed our regional transit authority and the county engineer to do extra work around the public way. That has leveraged an additional $34 million, uh, I'm sorry, that's $43 million in federal transportation dollars. We were one of the few cities to get back-to-back -back Tiger two and three funding for the two uh, RTA stations, and it was because of the collaboration, um, bringing all these partners together, the city, the institutions together, going to Washington and talking to them about this work. In addition, cleaning up railroad bridges that we couldn't touch before, getting one of them torn down that will really is an eyesore in the community and making a difference. And if you look here, Place matters. Case Western Reserve undergrad uh, enrollment after Uptown was built has almost tripled. If you look from putting the, and they anecdotally say that the Uptown development has helped attract more students. So place does matter. But what's more important is how do we connect people to place and opportunity? And so as part of our strategy, we also looked at workforce and other opportunities, connecting residents to these opportunities. We replicated and worked with Bill Strickland out of Manchester, Bidwell, and Pittsburgh. Uh, we were the fourth replication. And this is a unique program. It's an after-school arts education program working with high school students to keep them in school. And they're learning ceramics, photography, digital arts, music, recording, and production, and just recently we added film and studio. And these youth are getting to shoot corporate headshots, they're doing commercials, but it's a really vibrant place to give people opportunities. And we started with ninth graders in 2010, and we have our first 12th graders about to graduate, and already some are getting uh, scholarships to college, so 
we have six on the fast track and two, um, one just got a full ride to NYU Tisch um, School of the Arts. Um, and full ride, I just found out, was 60,000 annually. This is some of the youth work. They shoot Design Week, Fashion Week when they come to Cleveland. And then we do adult programming right now, working with our anchor partners who not only support this but sit on the board. We've trained, we train individuals as phlebotomy and farm, farm techs. And we have a 78% um, graduation uh, placement rate at this point. Uh, again, finding opportunities to link people to real careers. And people in these programs are unemployed, underemployed, are making an average of $27,000 now with full benefits when they graduate and get hired. So it's not just giving a job, but it's creating opportunities and building wealth. In addition, um, working with uh, one of the largest car dealerships in Northeast Ohio, uh, we did a pilot program called Drive to Succeed. The um, dealer gave us 10 brand new Nissans last year, 2014 Nissans, to help individuals get to work. And we've tested this with our New Bridge and Evergreen co-op workers. We had people taking buses at 2.30 in the morning to get to 5.30 a.m. jobs. And so giving people quality transportation, having them go through budget counseling so that they'll be able to purchase the car at the end of a year, the dealer is actually paying the insurance and the cost of the car during that year. Uh, Evergreen, again, this is the Evergreen Cooperative Laundry. It was the first to launch. Um, as you can see, very, it's a uh, high tech. This was a $6 million capital investment. It was done with loans. And this is where our city of Cleveland has really stepped up. Um, our economic development director and the mayor uh, put not only um, HUD $108, but this is how we've been using uh, blending capital with bank debt, new markets, tax credits to support these type of projects. The uh, Evergreen Energy Solutions, which was formerly known as Ohio Cooperative Solar, is doing solar installation, installations with the um, anchors, just completed a uh, one megawatt ground mounted uh, solar array with 3,000 panels in the city of East Cleveland. They're now doing LED lighting with the institutions, um, as you see here, and as well as weatherization and home, um, home construction and repair. And then Green City Growers was just open last year. This is the largest hydroponic greenhouse in the country, three and a half acres under glass. It will grow up to three million heads of leafy greens and 300,000 pounds of basil and parsley and herbs uh, annually. So again, another way to look at wealth building. And in this case, we were bringing the businesses to the neighborhood, training people for jobs that exist, and using the procurement and purchasing power of our anchor institutions to help support the businesses, but also having those contracts in place to help others buy from these um, companies. And this is, again, um, just more photos of Green City Growers. And then the Health Tech Corridor. This is a four-mile corridor between downtown and University Circle in the Midtown uh, neighborhood of Cleveland. And here we worked with BioEnterprise, which was a regional organization. But in 2010, the foundation funded an economic development study and worked with them to focus on a, a place-based initiative, working with Midtown, the city, and other partners. In this area, um, we have over 75 biotech medical research companies in 10 buildings along here. And so the goal now is to fill this in with um, other housing and things. And I was just talking to, at the pre-reception, our foundation just made a grant to the city of Cleveland to hire a person for real estate that will manage the real estate from the city. And we're hiring a health tech corridor manager that will report to uh, Midtown Cleveland and a group that's the foundation, the city, bioenterprise, and Midtown, so we can market this area. The city has did target investment here of over 77 million in loans, which has resulted in over $200 million of investment, has uh, created 1,300 jobs and retained over 1,800 jobs. Again, ways to look at how we use the purchasing power with not only the anchors, the city, and others, but this collaboration to really push the agenda further. 
We work with organizations like National Development Council. National Development Council is a national organization that does investment um, for jobs and community development. They oversaw our Evergreen Cooperative Development Fund as well as we were a Living Cities Integration Initiative, uh, the $12 million in debt. And they work with the city and the county with SBA loans and other um, products in the city of Cleveland. As we looked at our economic development strategy, we have an economic development director, Shilpa Kadar, working with Huntington Bank. There was a study done and we realized that there was a huge need for micro lending in the neighborhoods. And so we brought Economic and Community Development Institute from Columbus, Ohio into Cleveland. And they've been up and running uh, less than two years. They've done over one, one and a half million dollars in loans to 90 businesses in the Cleveland area and we're putting a heavy focus in the greater university circle area. And they fund unbankable companies. They provide all the supports that you need working with an array of partners, doing business planning and putting them through courses to try and help these businesses not only um, get up and sustain themselves, but actually grow. And around the country, we had this discussion earlier too, they're working with the Democracy Collaborative, Ted Howard you saw in the video, uh, who works very closely with us and his team. They're talking to cities around the country. Uh, we just um, did a wealth building uh, summit in Jacksonville, Florida, but this is giving you an idea of how other cities are learning from us. In Atlanta, they have the Atlanta Lettuce Project, and this is with the Atlanta Community Foundation, and that's gonna be their first business. Now their greenhouse model is going to be a little bit different because there's new growing technology that's out now and they're working really uh, going to do theirs on a seven acre site but really moving forward with that. In DC there's the Western Washington Regional Association of Grant Makers that's uh, working with the group City First and Next Street Partners um, and they're focusing initially on stormwater manage management to create jobs and create small businesses. And then um, in Jacksonville, Florida, they came to Cleveland in February um, and Mayor Alvin Brown there really brought together a, a lot of leaders to hear from all the different cities about how we were doing this and they're going to be kicking off their uh, community wealth building initiative and looking at opportunities to really change the way they do business there. Uh, Native American communities, we had a group come from um, the Twin Cities with the Northwest Area Foundation about a month and a half ago. And again, just more people around the country changing the narrative and how we look at community and how people are looking at partnerships and collaborations to leverage resources in a different way to serve underserved communities. Now, the most important piece of the work that we do is our community engagement strategy. And when we started, community engagement was always one of the pieces of this, uh, of our pro program. But we wanted to take our time, because too often we say community engagement and it's door knocking, passing out flyers, you know, the, the typical. And we said, we don't want to do that. We want people to be at the table, authentically engaged in our work. And so Neighborhood Connections is a program under the Cleveland Foundation that celebrated its 10th anniversary last year. Um, it started out as a small grants program and now has evolved to a small grants program and a community building and engagement uh, group. Our board just made a $3.3 million grant to Neighborhood Connections for the next three years, not only to continue the work across the city, but to create a community of practice across the city, teaching what we've learned in Greater University Circle. So with that, um, the video, and then I'll complete. I am from City Rising Farm which is an urban agriculture education program here in the city of Cleveland. Our youngest is a little less than two, the oldest is 91. I like to say that we're multi-everything because you will find some of everybody at City Rising Farm. Maggie's Farm is basically urban agriculture. I feel we've created an urban oasis, an urban ag oasis is what I like to call it. It's a real community building activity from the start, from building it 
to using it. It's all about community. And we're so grateful to Neighborhood Connections for believing in us and saying, hey, this is outside of the box, but let's give them a try. Well, Neighborhood Connections is a, it's a community building program and a small grants program. And it was started 10 years ago by the Cleveland Foundation uh, with the intention of inviting people to participate in the community and giving them support and resources and connections to really get active and engaged. The idea of Neighborhood Connections was making an investment in the people who live in Cleveland's neighborhoods that was parallel to and connected to the investment that the foundation had made in bricks and mortar community development. The program's funded you know, thousands of groups all over the city of Cleveland and now the city of East Cleveland for the past 10 years doing everything from you know, community gardens, public murals, after school programs for kids. As you can see, uh, we have a neighborhood basketball program. It's uh, bi-weekly. As our mantra says, come one, come all. All are welcome all the time. I basically live in this area for all my life. We never had a recreation center that was welcoming or inviting. I decided I wanted to do something to reach out to the community. And this is what we came up with. Everyday people can get funding to do extraordinary things in their own neighborhoods. I run a tumbling program called PACE, which stands for Positive Attitude Changes Everything. I work with uh, at-risk and some behaviorally handicapped children, and I work with the kids on self-esteem, hygiene, and the I can do attitude just to push them to the next level of their academic endeavors. The name of the band is the Pride of Glenville Marching Band, and we are emphasizing the word pride. It's like a little band that could. And we're just a bunch of people that come together. We love the community, and we love sharing joy and love in the community. And it's just another way to keep us all connected. Neighborhood Connections, right? The Pride of Glenville is a way to keep us all connected. The unique part about the Neighborhood Connections grant program is it's made up of 24 neighborhood residents that's the grant making committee and they make the decisions as to who gets the grants. The decisions are made by residents and they make all the funding decisions. I have encountered some amazing people who are doing just amazing things in their, in their neighborhoods, for their neighborhoods and with their neighbors. It's not a big nonprofit coming into this neighborhood and saying this is what we think this community needs. This is grassroots people saying, hey, we would like to do something, and here's a resource to help us do it. We had a major, massive cleanup back here. This alley was abandoned, and it's trash. People were dumping things in it. There was graffiti on this wall. The people just said, saying, enough is enough. And so we want to take this alley back over and just make it somewhere where we can actually walk through here, ride the bikes, play with the kids, you know, and enjoy it. It, it belongs to us, you know, it belongs to the neighbors here. As we've begun this process of cleaning up, painting, priming, sanding, more of the neighbors have gotten involved. You've got kids involved, you've got, you know, grandmothers, you've got really everyone that you can possibly engage getting involved, and that starts to change how everyone interacts with each other. Like, they're outside more often, their kids are playing together more often. People that really just said hi and bye, now they're out here talking and eating together and working together. This has already brought the neighborhood together and it's not even finished yet. Well, I think what makes me proud about the Neighborhood Connection program over the last 10 years is how it's grown. And people see this as a national model. The fact that it's still here and that there's still so much interest in it shows that what they did mattered and uh, continues to matter. Neighborhood Connections, bringing people together to say, we choose to create a better neighborhood. It changes the face of the neighborhood. It changes how people think about themselves and how people think about the world around them. The power is in our own hands, the power is in our hands, that we have the power to change the world and everybody has something to give, no matter where they've been or what they've done. It's all part of the, the Cleveland Renaissance is happening on a, on a higher level as well. It has to all happen at once or else it's not going to be a success. Well, I wish every 
city had a neighborhood connections program. The next phase of this is, is, is happening where we're really building these connections and, and really building strength and power in the communities to create a more equitable and more just society. So, neighborhood connections. I just want to give it, at the end you saw about the neighbor up. One of the things we did in uh, universe, Greater University Circle, because we wanted to make sure it was engaged, the goal was to break down barriers among neighbors, across neighborhoods, but institutions to neighborhoods. And so they started in 2011 bringing people together through network-centric organizing, doing neighbor circles, doing these dinners. And then they created what is called the Neighbor Up Network. Anybody can come. So the first Thursday of each month at the church, you saw the oil can church, that's what we call it. Uh, people just come from institutions, businesses, all over. They have over 1,000 members now, uh, 300 actually are card carrying neighbor up network uh, folks. But you go any first Thursday, even during our biggest snowstorms, there was standing room only. Over 100 people show up at these. And it starts out as a way, when you walk in the room, it levels the playing field. You come in as yourself, not I'm from this institution or that. And they start out with a, a really uh, easy way for people to work together. We sit in circles, and they do what they call ripples and joy, then a marketplace, and then a bump and spark, and then a chat. <laughs> and if you want to know more, go on the network and find out. <laughs> But it's really um, that, that model, and we work, looked at models around the country. We uh, worked real close with Bill Trainer and Frank, Frankie Blackburn from Lawrence, Massachusetts, Lawrence Works. Um, they, they have been really instrumental in helping us to um, guide and lead this. And so now this is being spread not only um, all over the city, but people learning this model. And it's been just an amazing um, opportunity to work with residents and to show you how it's affected our anchors, um, University Hospital started an employee resource group. And that employee resource group are made up of residents that live in our seven neighborhoods that are now going to be ambassadors for recruiting people for jobs to university hospitals. And so they work with our Neighborhood Connections team, and Neighborhood Connections is involved uh, with university hospitals and others on a and the clinic in case on a community health study. They're also doing a um, pilot program for hiring called Step Up to UH to get people hired. So it's a lot of different programs that are coming as a result of the neighborhood connections. And as I close, I want to talk about lessons learned. One of the things about our project is that you got to be flexible and nimble, willing to take risks, but also be transparent. And the reason this matters is because the power of this anchor-led community reinvestment strategy really demonstrates the power and potential of collaborations and partnerships. You know, I hear people say, oh, I get tired of hearing the collaborative word. I can tell you we truly have partnerships and collaborations, and we, no one institution and no organization could do the work we could do by ourselves. We're leveraging the gifts that each other bring to the table through financial, uh, intellectual and human capacity. And you couldn't ask for more than that. And it really um, demonstrates the level of local philanthropy as a catalyst for making change in our community. I think um, the first lesson, creating a forum for in-depth dialogue, we've created a safe space for our anchor partners to come together to work on initiatives that aren't the really responsibility of any single institution but are important to all of us. We've invested in relationship building. It takes a lot of time to build those relationships and you gotta know and respect the relationships that you build. Um, it minimizes outside pressure on in the, in, any individual institution. And we identify the Cleveland Foundation as ourselves as kind of the neutral convener. 
You know, we don't have a set agenda and we can work at the behest of all of our partners for the betterment of the area and really engaging our anchor partners at all levels and all staff. And I talked a little bit in our earlier session, we have a, the leadership table that's convened, we have an economic inclusion committee with these three subcommittees, buy, live, and hire local with about 70 different people participating and setting goals annually for how the anchors and the neighborhoods and organizations will work on these initiatives. We defined our programs and scope by geographic boundaries, we engage local, national, and international experts. We include people-focused programs because too often and too long, community development focused on bricks and mortar and left the people out of the equation. And it's important, you, you see this kind of all over the country now, people are getting back to basic community development, community organizing, engaging residents and people at the table around our neighborhoods. And it allows our program the flexibility, like I talked about, to pivot and, and react when things don't work. Being flexible and nimble enough to make change where it's necessary and quickly. And protecting the initiative from changes in institutional and political leadership. You know, it's been nine years and the leadership table pretty much is the same. We just had one person retire. And so to have our anchors engaged for nine years with the CEOs and the leadership, and I think it's really important at the time that this started, we had all those leaders were brand new leaders in Cleveland. So that was, you know, a, a blessing in itself that we had people that were willing to work together unlike the past. I think building support and spreading the word. We center our strategies around the shared vision. We seek visibility from within and outside the local community from others. We emphasize the importance of place, local economies, and people to anchor our institutions and encourage and expect co-investment. And that's the other thing. Everybody has to have skin in the game for this to work. You got to have skin in the game. When we talk to other cities about this, we have, you know, everybody needs to put something in at the table. And I want to finish with um, the Cleveland Foundation in celebrating our centennial have been talking about turning your passion into purpose. And I thought about you, the students here. I met a lot of first year and second year students and I know that as you continue your journey and your growth and the challenges and opportunities that you face, be passionate about what you do. Be authentic about what you do. And don't be afraid to ask for help. And make sure that you take your passion and use it for a good purpose, and you will succeed in life. Thank you. OK, now take questions. So. Uh, you showed um, the map of how the diversity in the neighborhood changed. I was wondering where the people that left, um, where they go. Well, if you saw the earlier maps, we got plenty of vacant property, pretty of vacant, a lot of vacant land, so people haven't left. Um, there are people leaving because of the foreclosures, but the people that we're trying to attract in, so we are also very cognizant on, that's why the community engagement piece is so important, that we're engaging the residents that are currently there and engaging them so that they can don't get pushed out when 10 years from now, and that's what we're thinking 10 and 20 years out. If anything, we learned from um, University of um, Pennsylvania, the West Philly, they didn't plan for success. You had a single institution, a single neighborhood. So we originally explored a, um, a community land trust, but a commercial land trust. And with having so much vacant land, it really didn't work. And we're still looking at opportunities to figure out how do we work in the neighborhood so that we can control what happens there, integrate people into the community at the same time, engage the people in place so that they are part of it. Okay, and my second question, uh, with the city growers and the, um, the city rising gardens, I was wondering if that feeds people as well, because there's a lot of food deserts and things, or? or so there, actually, um, Cleveland in 2009, we commissioned a 
a study with uh, Neighborhood Progress and then Parkworks is now known as Land Studio. It's called the 25% Food Shift. And at that time, which we didn't know, we were number two behind Minneapolis with the number of urban farms and gardens in the city of Cleveland. I think we had 256 urban gardens then and 12 uh, urban farms. That has increased tremendously. Uh, Neighborhood Progress, now called Cleveland Neighborhood Progress because they merged three groups, uh, has a program uh, called Reimagining Cleveland and the city and the, and different foundations put money into a pot so rising farms and others can have these gar urban gardens around the city and sell their food. And there's one area um, that's in there, the central neighborhood where uh, Evergreen, the Green City Growers is. Uh, the CDC there, um, Burton Bell Carr, they were designated a, a HHS a food desert and they got a large grant, but there you have a group called Ridall that uh, went through Will Allen's Growing Power, and they've created a tilapia farm and garden there, and they're doing retail. So there's a lot of work going on. On the west side of Cleveland, we helped fund um, the Ohio City Farm, and that's an immigrant workers farm, a six acre farm on the west side of Cleveland where they grow and sell their vegetables. So it's a lot of that kind of activity happening all over the city now. Can you talk a little bit about the foundation's relationship with the city government and uh, how different was their vision for the neighborhood compared to yours? Um, as you see, um, the city works very closely with us. They have been at the table on all of these initiatives. The mayor supports our work. Our economic development director is integral to this work that we're doing. So when we started the Evergreen Cooperatives, the city um, invested in the Evergreen Laundry. When we did Green City Growers, it's because of the city. They helped us acquire a 10-acre uh, brownfield. They put $10 million in, two in a brownfield economic development grant, and an $8 million in, um, in loan, uh, HUD 108. So the city has been integral to all of our work, and they're at the table every step of the way. And in Cleveland, I talked about this earlier, too, we have a very robust community development system. We have very strong CDCs working in these neighborhoods. So they're at the table as well as well as the city planning departments, our CDCs, the city, we all work very close together. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. And um, it must be difficult to synchronize the needs and the desires of you know, such a variety of stakeholders. So you must have like different strategies perhaps and I was wondering if you used co-design or participatory design methods or processes for example like in urban planning or design for the bringing the collaboration together yes yes actually um, when our CEO brought the leadership together the CEOs um, after year meeting they agreed that they would have their senior staff work with, us, work with our senior staff. And so on a day-to-day -day basis, myself, Lillian Curry, Ted Howard, uh, Walter Wright, Annabelle, we all work very closely with our anchor partners. We sit down um, and meet individually with the anchors, and then we have these meetings where we meet together and we lay out the priorities. We also check in, has anything changed? And the best thing around healthcare reform, is there anything different now than when we set our priorities three years ago that may affect the work we're doing. And so May 9th, we have our meeting to agree on the next three year priorities. We've kind of socialized it individually with each institution and then uh, collectively. And so the priorities is gonna be neighborhood stabilization in those three neighborhoods, continuing the development of the transit oriented projects, as well as uh, a huge focus on workforce and procurement. So we pretty much have that figured out in terms of the priorities and then some of the projects and then through this other layer, this committee I talked about, the live, hire, and buy local, that's where the work gets done by the next layer of staff, setting you know goals each year from each institution and all those anchors are at the table and talking about how we accomplish that. So it's a lot of shared information between there. It's a lot of work. And so that's what we do. We share that information and that work. And it's, you know, it's not always easy, but, you know, I mean, it's lasted nine years and we're getting more people involved. And one thing I had to um, 
when our community engagement team started, you know, being neighborhood organizers and from the community, when we started this, you know, they came banging on the table and saying, oh, they didn't come talk to the community when they built this and they didn't. And I said, oh, but they did. And this is how. And so one of the things I learned to teach them is that we all work in bureaucracies, but within each bureaucracy are people who care. And it's up to us to find those people like us that are passionate, that care about that, and figure out how to work the systems across and up and down. And once they started learning that, now they're at the table sitting with the CEOs and senior C-level staff of these anchor institutions without me at the table. I don't have to go to those meetings. I don't have to be there. And so it's sharing the power. And that's something else. We've got to be willing to give up the power and let others uh, step in and, and work on that. So it was no formula to it. It's just been working so far. <laughs> thank, thank you for that presentation. The, the transformation in that area is really remarkable. Uh, when I, I was there 20 years ago, it was a very different place. So hospitals of the anchor institutions that you have there, hospitals for a lot of good reasons tend to be very insular. And it was interesting in the projects that you showed, the Uptown Housing, the MOCA, are really high profile uh, projects that aren't necessarily directly related to the hospitals. And my question is, with the changes in the Affordable Care Act and the need for the hospitals to more closely calibrate their delivery to the, to the, the residents that they serve, are you finding the potential for some more healthcare related programs and services and buildings to be located along these seems with the neighborhood, or do you think that that seam will continue to be primarily commercial or, or housing? Can you talk about that influence? Yeah, I, think, I think yes to both. Um, again, our neighborhood connections team is working now on a community health project, and the first year is listening listening to the community, listening to the anchors, so that they're not being prescriptive. The other piece, and when I talk about the procurement and buying power, uh, especially university hospitals, uh, when they did their $1.2 billion spend for their Vision 2010 expansion, they created their own community benefits agreement with the city and others. And they worked to make sure that minority women and small businesses were part of that. And over, I think, they had a high percent, I think it was like 80% of that went into Northeast Ohio. And they worked with over 110 small business companies, everything from paying for the bonding um, for those companies to work over that five year period, figuring out how to pay those companies. And so that has actually helped our city look at how their community benefits agreement is put together. And now we're trying to get beyond construction jobs. So university hospitals um, actually use their buying power to get one of their medical um, distribution facilities to locate in the city of Cleveland, Owens and Miners. It's under construction at this point. Um, they are now putting offices way down below where, where their campuses are into the community. And we're starting to work on some of those type of initiatives with them. I can't talk about all of them, but we have some, um, and that's where the city is really, really critical. So working with the city of Cleveland, uh, our economic development department to help facilitate those kind of moves. And it's really about helping create jobs. It's about bringing you know, resources into the city, tax paying jobs, and helping to shore up the neighborhoods because everybody wants people to live closer to work. All of our hospitals have a parking problem. So they, you know, if they can get people on public transportation, that's a plus. If they can get people to live closer to work where they can walk or take public, it's a plus for them. So again, I, you know, it's been one piece at a time. Um, procurement's a little bit harder, but we're tracking it, and they're doing a better job of trying to make sure that they get, um, you know, smaller companies a lot of the work. locally mm -hmm. um, specifically wanted to know if you ran to any union issues and initially when you were starting off with convincing these anchors to use evergreen the co-op model if they were required to cancel any of their contracts if they had to lose money I mean typically these institutions have signed long-term contracts or they have union 
you know, workers on aspects. And I'm just curious how that all was able to work out. Well, actually, when we started the Evergreen Co-ops, these ideas actually came from the anchors. So we hired uh, Ted Howard from the Democracy Collaborative to interview our anchor partners. And, that, and they came back with about 60 or 70 different ideas of kind of low-hanging fruit, things that didn't exist in the community that they would work with. So the idea for the laundry actually came from the head of the VA hospital. The idea for the solar actually came from Cleveland Clinic. And so working with the anchors, so one lesson learned, um, even though we had verbal commitments in the beginning, when it came time to undo some of those contracts, and that's not to get all the business, just to do carve-outs, that's when we ran into more of the legal issues and, you know, with the companies. But now that's starting, you know, they learned and we learned. And so how those commitments get done is making sure they got skin in the game up front, that we have the commitments and that not just one anchor, but at more than one anchor commits to the purchasing. But, the, but most of the businesses that we have created actually came from them. And, and let me say, and they chair, they're on the board. They've all invested financially um, into the Evergreen Fund, and they chair and sit on the board of the Evergreen Cooperative Corporation. Okay. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have two questions for you. One is, um, it, it looks like, I mean, we saw all the vacancy, and so certainly there's not a significant amount of displacement right now. But with um, the employer-assisted housing program, the vast majority of the money is bringing new people into the neighborhood. And I was wondering if part of your strategy for displacement prevention was the workforce development side. Well, is uh, in well, terms of displacement. Well, asset, asset building and workforce development to raise the income so that people can afford to live there when prices rise. Well, two things. When we did the study on this, most people were under the, you know, belief that most of the people moving in are very high income. It's the opposite. Most of the people working in those institutions make fifty thousand dollars or less. Probably about seventy-five percent. Um, only about 2% make over $200,000. So a lot of the people that are working there um, trying to get them to move in are probably, the median income right now is about $88,000. And that includes the rental. We're going to separate that out because the rental would be higher. So if we went back and did it, it would probably be even lower. The other piece is that because we have uh, so much vacant property, and so much uh, need in to bring people, because Cleveland has lost a lot of population. And so the need to get people to come back to the city, um, we wish we could double the program and get the word out even more. Because if, if you look at that five, eight, you know, five square miles, that's a lot of territory to cover. And it's going to take a lot to really make an impact. But we started um, with our community engagement working um, just north of Case Western Reserve with um, residents, uh, this area called, that the residents renamed Circle North. Um, to engage the residents, one, so that they feel like the development being built on Euclid is for them. Two, to, again, engage them with the anchors. And so we started out with the neighbor circles. We had Evergreen Energy Services um, with a grant from the foundation and from a bank go in and fix houses, do um, exterior home repair of some of the houses there. We, uh, the celebration you saw at the end with the mayor, and that was the community celebration that they put together. And um, in this four block area in over eight months, I was just astonished at how well the community has come together. But we started a youth lawn care. I was driving down um, one of the streets and I saw three vacant houses and I said, okay, who's gonna cut the grass? And the organizer for the CDC said, well, can I use your money to get the youth together and buy some tools? We started out with nine youth. We now have 50. So we just gave another grant to the CDC. And as part of that, we're going to do a year-long youth engagement program. But for every hour that they get paid, they have to donate two hours back to the community. So another way not only to break down barriers with the youth, but also with older adults who were scared of the youth, now they work together. 
If I had another video show you that, you would do, it would have you crying. But again, engaging residents in place. We were doing uh, walking tours to the museum, movie nights, um, getting people to feel like the, you know they're part of it. And then Case Western Reserve will be doing their campus master plan and working with neighborhood connections in all the communities to include the residents in that part of it. Thank you. And then I had my other question was that there's a real tension in this field right now. Mm -hmm around um, place-based investment and opportunity-based investment, or connecting people to opportunity and allowing them to live where they want. And um, it looks like you're addressing both investing in place and investing in people, but I was wondering if you, um, how you kind of navigated that tension with such a strong, um, aim to bring people back into the area? Uh, we haven't felt the tension yet. Um, again, we're trying to figure out how to get people, and I think putting amenities back in the neighborhood will then make it a place where people want to come. Another good example, the Evergreen um, workers, um, you know, had approached me, you know, uh, when are you going to get us some houses? Because we had talked about doing an evergreen village and going in, buying up vacant streets and having them all live together. So working with Cleveland Housing Network, we actually gave, the foundation gave them a grant to do a 0% mortgage loan to the evergreen workers. And now we have, uh, we said, we'll test it out. This was another pilot. We have 15 people who now have homes and five more in the pipeline. But what's interesting, they're buying their houses on the same street and now creating their own street clubs and taking back the neighborhood. So to have people that want to, first of all, I think it's pretty amazing that they work together and they want to live on the same street. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that's pretty good. But, you know, they're seeing themselves, too, as ambassadors and leaders in the community. Because one of the things with Evergreen, you know, we hire people from the community and people say, well, when they start making money, how do you keep them from leaving? And we can't really stop them from leaving, but giving them opportunity to be part of rebuilding their community. And then in some cases, people need to leave the neighborhoods they're in because of the influences around them. inspiring. I'd like to ask you if you have done anything in particular for women, neglected women, to make them more independent, give back to the community, just particularly women together? Have no, we haven't focused directly, but there are organizations that we work with that have been doing that. So we have been trying to be more homogenous in our work to bring people together. But there are organizations that do that within the community. And, and one of the tenets of our community engagement is creating off and on ramps where people come and choose and pick and choose where they come in and out. And it's our job to let them know about the resources. So when they come to a neighbor up network, they can learn about resources in the community and pick and choose how to use those resources. And so we said, we're not gonna make this a thing where people show up and you tell them what to do. We give people, you come in, here's the resources and they connect. And I'll give an example, when we do the uh, marketplace, which I love, people can make a request and offer or a declaration and they go around the room, it's like 100, 150 people and you know, and they give you 30 seconds or a minute. And in that 30 seconds or a minute, you gotta get it out. So you'll have, uh, we had a young man, he said, I need to learn how to parallel park by Tuesday. This was on a Thursday, because, so I can get this job. Three people raised their hand to help him parallel park. They take their names and do that. You know, um, uh, I was at one where a lady, uh, a businessman got up and said, I will give a fax machine to any new nonprofit. And this woman who actually talked to somebody else, didn't know him, starts crying because she had just told somebody else she needed that. And another woman said, but I need a copy machine. He said, okay, I'll give three fax machines and two copiers, just like that. And so what we're doing, people have got so caught up in technology and not talking to each other that your resources are typically in the room. And getting people to reconnect by being a resource to each other, and that's what the value of this kind of neighbor up network centric organizing does. It gets people to communicate, it gets people that don't know each other from diverse backgrounds to work with each other, and it brings resources back. And that's what's been, you know, the beauty of the work that we've been doing. And so, you know, I can give you all kinds of examples. And then at the end, they have the uh, chat in the room where you can get up and say, I want to talk about 
FAFSA, college applications, and so a group will go off to this room. I want to talk about workforce, and they'll go off, and people pick and choose where they come in and out of those rooms. And so that's the methods that we have been using to engage people. Uh, I think that's a great place to, uh, to let uh, okay. India uh, take a breath. Uh, thank you all for coming very much.